Good morning, everyone. It is Oscar Day. Oscars 2020. And boy, do we have quite a lineup to see tonight, depending on who wins in each of the categories. We have 24 total to get through. I am a little sleep deprived, but we are going to get through this. Now, I figured I would start at the bottom and work my way up and end with Best Picture. Now, unlike previous years, there are five particular standouts, and it seems that the website Gold Derby and other various websites that have kept track of the awards as December, January, and now February have come through, it's now down to roughly two or three movies, and we're going to get to them. So the bottom, I'd say... The first five, I admit I have not been on track to properly judge those, but I will still predict them anyway. And I'm just going to go off the uh, favorites for the ones I am not sure about. But so anyways, live action short. Again, like there are theaters nearby that show it, but because of my leg, I wasn't able to get out and ride my wheel to the theater as often. But Given that the odds are 69 against 20 for the neighbor's window, I think the safest bet would be to do neighbor's window and then just, you know, click them all in for the runners up. So you save it next on that. Oh, and it automatically jumps back to best picture. Funny. So, best documentary short. Learning to skateboard in a war zone. Already, that name attracts a lot of people and the odds are 31 to 10 like that's almost three to one essentially so we'll click on that and the following films are st louis superman walk run cha-cha in the absence life overtakes me i mean i'm sure each one of those films are great documentary shorts and definitely cover very important topics however the thing to keep in mind is that three of them share the odds. And if we're going strictly statistically, you know that nine of those films have really stood out. All right, moving on to, let's see here. You now have animated short. This one is a bit easier to decide, but again, it's because it has Disney and Pixar backing it up and Hair Love was the film that is the only one that I've seen. So I think that it's an easy choice for me to pick. Again, just like the previous category, three of the films have a nine to two, nine against two ratio odds of winning. Hair Love has 82 to 25. So that's pretty obvious of where that's going. Now, continuing on, yikes, we are in for quite a ride right now. Best international film, this is now where the ride goes. It is obviously going to be Parasite. It's not even a question. Um, I heard great things about Pain and Glory, Antonio Banderas getting nominated for his portrayal in that film. That would be a very close runner-up, but it's pretty obvious that Parasite's going to dominate this category, just like Roma did last year. Ugh. All right, moving on. Best documentary feature. Um, it was just reported the other night that American Factory is the heavy favorite to win this. Again, the odds are 82 to 25. That's pretty safe to bet. Again, I've only started watching that a little bit um, on Netflix. I have to finish it up, but based on the first 20 minutes of it, I can see why it is a heavy favorite to win. Best animated feature. Oh man, I love this category. Because of the diversity of the companies, it's no longer Disney versus Disney. Like, unpopular opinion. I'm glad and relieved that Frozen 2 got snubbed. I didn't bother to see it. I thought that the first one was, it, it was all right for a you know princess film. I mean, I'm not its target audience, so I can't judge it too harshly on that. 
but Toy Story 4 is a runaway favorite. However, GoldDerby.com has it noted that Klaus, the Netflix like Christmas movie, has a 37 to 10 odds of also winning. I normally stick with Pixar. I've been a Pixar fan since I, as long as I can remember. But I also want Netflix to finally like get some real awards. And we'll get to that later on. Anyways, Toy Story 4 is my choice for animated feature. Visual effects is now, like as you can see, I'm wearing a Star Wars shirt today. But I'm not voting for The Rise of Skywalker, and I'll tell you why. Because that film, the visual effects were not as impressive as they could have been. When we're looking at visual effects, there is the time to discuss if visual effects add too much to a film, overcompensate for a film, or add enough depth to help a film be immersive. And because of that last one, I'm really between the edge of The Irishman still or Avengers Endgame. I understand that 1917 has the best odds to win because of the type of film that it is. However, it's been over 11 years since Avengers or like Marvel Cinematic Universe has been nominated for countless best visual effects and always lost. And even last year, infamously, Infinity War lost to First Man. And then First Man has an Oscar. And then a documentary based on the same exact topic, Apollo 11, got snubbed completely when it was going to be a front runner for best documentary feature. It sent some shockwaves. So anyways... Best visual effects, I am personally going to give it to Avengers Endgame, but I personally want Irishman to win because combining Martin Scorsese, Al Pacino, Joe Pesci, and Robert De Niro with the groundbreaking like technology of de-aging with no dots, there's a whole like video that covers this on the internet that I watched that really captivated how the approach was different for this film. So, like, I, I hope The Irishman gets some recognition, but bold prediction here, folks. Irishman gets an egg. It'll break my heart. But I'm sadly thinking that the Academy is really trying to rub it into Netflix right now. That may be a uh, conspiracy, but I'm willing to believe it. So anyways, Avengers is my pick for best visual effects because MCU is long overdue and, it, you know, the, if it's not going to get nominated for best picture despite finally topping Avatar for highest grossing film of all time. Anyways, best sound mixing. This one's tough. Um, I'm a visual guy first and sound I'm really still trying to like really understand how the Academy judges films with sound. I mean, last year was not fair because Bohemian Rhapsody just used Queen music, and I, I will defend Bohemian Rhapsody, but getting the sweep for film editing, best sound editing, and sound mixing was a bit uncalled for. Should have gone to other films that year. But best sound mixing, I, I like all five of these films. I really think that like one of them does have a better chance of winning compared to the others, and if I was a strictly betting man, which for this, you know, simulation I am, I think that 1917 does have the best chance of winning. But I do appreciate the sound mixing in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So that's why it's my number two overall and my first runner-up. But I think 1917 is going to take for sound mixing. Okay. Moving on to sound editing. This time instead of Ad Astra, which again, I was as a sci-fi fan, I wasn't really too impressed by Ad Astra, but teach their own. Best sound editing, four of the same films are here, but instead of Ad Astra, you get Star Wars. And I'm still not gonna vote for Star Wars. I, 
1917, Ford vs. Ferrari, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and Joker. We'll get to Joker at a later time, but it breaks my heart that it is not being considered a bit higher in these odds. Uh, the safest bet would probably be 1917, but I think that Ford vs. Ferrari was a great, great sound quality movie. Pun intended. I'll put 1917 as my first runner-up, and I'll put Joker behind Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Rise of Skywalker being last. Again, nothing personal against Star Wars, but... It, it, this is for another video. All right. Continuing on for original song, this I'm going to just go right through these. I'm Gonna Love Me Again by Rocketman. That is the, like beyond beyond any dispute that's gonna win best original song it's like if they made an original song for bohemian rhapsody last year would have won it's just so for score this is the one in which i will happily defend joker to the end of time john williams i love you i really think that you could have earned one more win if star wars the rise of skywalker had a better overall reception but right now, it, it, it is very clear, once she won for the Golden Globe, that the composer was going to win the Oscar for Best Score here. It's, I absolutely loved her work. I can't recall her name, and I don't want to mispronounce it. I'll, I'll provide in the text right here. But like, I absolutely loved her work for both Chernobyl and Joker. I really think that she has a big future, and... Starting starting your career off with a Golden Globe and an Oscar is pretty impressive. Best production design. Oh boy. Man, I like each one of these films. And each one of these films does provide a whole set within their story that really grabs you and does not let go. When it comes to best production design, I think... You know, the the best odds right now are Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I can agree with that, actually. Um, Parasite, I can also see possibly winning because of how well they display the contrast between, you know, the poor neighborhoods and the rich, you know, affluent houses. And not to mention the reveal, won't spoil anything, but halfway through the film, in the plot and theme changes entirely. Which really caught me off guard and I like that but Irishman three and a half hours displaying you know the story of the life of you know Frank Sheeran that encompassed over 50 years the costume design that's a different category but I would definitely pick the Irishman as my first runner-up with Parasite being a very close third makeup and hair this one it's not fair because quite frankly it really could go either way um it depends on how much campaigning warner brothers has done for joker when i don't think the dark knight won for makeup no it didn't um but when it comes to best makeup and hairstyling i saw bombshell on christmas day with my family and like we were amazed by how accurate they portrayed megan kelly and the other females that were involved in the Fox News scandal. Oh yeah, like little quick footnote about Bombshell. When you open your film with important looking text that said that essentially says that the following performance is fictional and like fictitious, like you know, some leeway was done. Everyone in their mind, everyone inside their mind was thinking, except for Fox, because we all know this is Fox. Anyways, back to the back to this. Bombshell, definitely a good choice for best makeup and hairstyle. With Joker being a very close second, if I lose this one because Joker wins, I will not be mad whatsoever. I don't think 1917 was uh, convincing enough with its makeup and Maleficent. They they don't give those types of films like this Oscar. They, they don't usually give the Disney films this, from what I've recall, from what I can recall. Film editing. Ooh, man. It does kind of disappoint me that Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is not here, but Irishman and Joker are. 
Um, Jojo Rabbit is definitely a solid choice for this. But I would give film editing to probably... I mean, those odds are really close. Ford vs. Ferrari has a 17 to 5, and Parasite has an 18 to 5 ratio. That being said, Irishman and Joker and Jojo Rabbit all have 9 to 2. So you can pick any of those films if you want to like go against the, um, the spread. But for film editing, this is a very tough one. Like, this really is. I think it could actually go to Parasite, but it seems that Ford vs. Ferrari, it got nominated for Best Picture for a reason. And I think the reasons are the technical specifications of the film. So I'm gonna say Ford vs. Ferrari, but that's the only thing that really impressed me aside from Christian Bale's performance. It's just, Christian Bale's amazing. And it's, it's such an improvement over his Dick Cheney role, personally. But I would put Irishman as my first runner-up for that. Then all the other films accordingly. Costume design. This one can really go to anyone. And I personally want Once Upon a Time in Hollywood to win this. But I can totally see why Little Women will probably win this. Because Greta Gerwig got subbed for Best Director. That's another topic by itself that I really don't want to get into. Because kind of a that's probably going to get some hate, but you got to stand your ground. But yeah, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood winning Best Costume Design, because when you look at that film, when you are looking at the costumes and looking at the overall presentation of 1969 Hollywood, you feel like you just left present time and went to 1969. Like, it was such an en enriching, immersive experience. Like, it, it, it's pretty obvious that that's one of my favorite films of the year. Cinematography, it's not even a question, 1917. I don't even need to, like, look at the other ones. But Lighthouse only getting best cinematography? Oh my god, Academy. Why did you ignore this film? Like, flat out, why did you ignore The Lighthouse? This one got one nomination when it should have gotten, like, five or six. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people agree with me on that. But... Yeah, 1917 with a simulated continuous take is definitely awesome. Original screenplay. As a Tarantino fan myself, with that scene in Glorious Bastards, Pulp Fiction, Django Unchained, and two of those three actually won him the screenplay, he's not going to win Best Director, much as it pains me. It, he's not going to win. So I think they're going to give... Tarantino the consolation prize of best screenplay and Parasite will be a very close number two Knives Out I'm, I'm happily surprised that that got nominated in the first place 1917 was based off some stories that Sam Mendes's um grandfather I believe told him and that's what inspired him to make the film in the first place so that was pretty noble of him and that was noble of the Academy to recognize that but notice how Little Women's not nominated here folks It's because, you know why. Adapted screenplay. Oh, man. These choices, it makes it seem like Jojo Rabbit, like the odds are 82 to 25. I think that Irishman's actually going to win this one. Because if there's any Oscar that Irishman has a realistic chance of actually winning, it's adapted screenplay. Um, Joker, I think, is going heavily unnoticed. I think that, given that this is a artistic character study based off a character from DC, and there is l almost literal no connection aside from the Joker name and the Wayne family and Gotham, you take those three things away and just have it be about a, me a mentally disturbed loner that's trying to become a clown, this film would have like, just, Joker is one of those rare experiences in which, like, yes, it technically is a comic book movie because it's based off of characters from comic books, but it derives so much from that and does its own thing that I can't help but really appreciate it. 
Um, Jojo Rabbit, I saw only once. Um, I'm waiting for it to come out on iTunes or if it ever comes to Amazon or any of the other streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, HBO, etc. Maybe a few months from now, but they're trying to do the whole traditional theatrical release. But yeah, Irishman would be my vote, and that's a 9-2 to two odds. So, like, if you're going by odds, don't ignore that. Best Supporting Actor. This one I wanted to dive a little more into. Because I think that four of these were well-deserved. And one of them was added just for criteria. Brad Pitt is going to win this, no questions asked. Like, it's not even a contest at this point. However, the fact that they, and by they, I mean Martin Scorsese, Scorsese was able to convince Joe Pesci to come out of retirement and deliver a performance that is actually different from his portrayal in Raging Bull and Goodfellas and even Casino. Joe Pesci does the complete opposite of his sporadic and, like, over-the-top behavior in his other films, and he plays quite the mafia king. And once the film progresses over time, he still remains calm and collected, and he is, like, the unspoken, like, leader of the entire mob. And you get that vibe the entire time. Every time you see him on screen, you don't think, oh man, he's going to like flood out, burst out, and go completely insane. I think that Joe Pesci earned this nomination hands down, and if he wasn't going up against Brad Pitt, he would have had a chance. Maybe. But Brad Pitt is winning this hands down, and I can't wait to hear his speech tonight because I'm sure he's going to do something politically active but i don't think it'll be too much brad pitt is one of those easy money faces in hollywood i mean no offense to him i love brad pitt like i actually rewatched moneyball recently and that's a whole nother year like how he got snubbed like that whole film got snubbed. so moving on to best supporting actress this one i really think could go any other way um i saw all five of these movies and i thought that um, Laura Dern in Marriage Story, I agree with the majority. I think she's going to win tonight. Like, as you'll notice, all four of the acting categories are pretty much locks. And it's just, you know, fun to talk about each one of the individual performances. Margot Robbie, I think, did very well given her fictional role in Bombshell. If you have seen the movie, you know what scene I'm talking about with John Lithgow. And if you haven't seen the movie it's not exactly easy to get through. It's, you know, given the whole Me Too movement that happened a couple of years ago, is pretty much what inspired this scene to, like, really go into that, like, psychological detail. Scarlett Johansson being nominated for Best Leading Actress and Best Supporting Actress is a, is a double whammy in a good way. Like, I, I absolutely appreciate her being nominated in both categories. And Kathy Bates being nominated... For Richard Jewell, I honestly thought that the Academy was going to be nicer to Richard Jewell. Yes, it may have been like your typical Oscar bait film that didn't exactly work out the way they wanted it to. And not to mention the way the political environment has been at the Academy in recent years. They seem to purposely ignore Clint Eastwood. Even though Clint Eastwood has won Oscars before, he is a Hollywood legend. But... Politics ruin art sometimes. And this is one of those times. Now moving on to the final big, big four. All right, folks, we have arrived at the four big Oscar picks. Two of them are very obvious, like not even a contest. And the other two are completely up for debate between two or three ones. So bear with me here. To sum it up, Walkin' Phoenix is going to walk in onto that stage, click for that vote. He's going to win the Oscar. They are not going to introduce him as Joker, despite that would be what everyone wants to see. He will probably do some political speech about, 
you know, climate change and helping the planet while also maintaining, just like he did the Golden Globes, about the whole, you know, thanks for providing vegan meals. Maybe that was just Hollywood foreign press, but I was kind of surprised that Adam Sandler got completely snubbed. And to an extent, um, Eddie Murphy. I would have chosen Eddie Murphy or Adam Sandler over Jonathan Price, and that's nothing against Price. The two popes just didn't impress me as well as the other potential nominees did. It seemed that that film was kind of was actually like made for Netflix, and it wasn't really like trying to go for the whole Oscar crowd. But it got a nomination or two. But yeah, this one is this one is Phoenix's to lose, and. I, I can't wait to see what he has to say tonight on stage. Best Actress, Renee Zellweger. It's not even a contest. Though, if we were to talk about it being a contest, I can see Scarlett Johansson possibly sneaking in there, but it is way too big of a hill to climb against Renee Zellweger. When an actress like that puts on a performance like the titular eponymous performance like that it's really hard to top that especially when Scarlett Johansson was sharing half the movie with Adam Driver who's also nominated for best actor so they're both great as a team and great with chemistry but it all comes down to just you know which one can carry a film by themselves and Renee Zellweger mastered that all right, we only got two left. I'm gonna go into detail with each one. All right, we got to talk. Or at least I'm gonna monologue and you're gonna listen if you want to. Best director, four months ago, I was really, really gunning in support. Of course, as he. But then I watched all five films. And it's very clear that my previous two top choices had zero prayer for winning. And I have to, and I have to live with that. As, as a film buff myself, I, my personal favorites, just like a couple years ago with Spielberg's The Post and Nolan's Dunkirk... This year, Scorsese and Tarantino are going to lose to Sam Mendes. When you have your directorial debut be your Oscar win 20 years ago, the Academy loves doing repeats of something like that. They did it with Steven Spielberg between Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan just five years apart within the same decade. And Alejandro G. Inarritu won for Birdman and The Revenant in back-to-back -back years. So for him winning his second Oscar in 20 years, the Academy loves like putting numbers together like that. But not just to mention the undertake that Mendes went through to get 1917 made the way it was and co and cooperating with Roger Deakins and just like communicating with all the actors. Notice how none of the acting categories had someone from 1917 because that film is not an acting movie. That movie is a technical movie. And when you have one long continuous take like that, that takes a certain type of planning that no other film gets to have to do. Those are types of films that really set them apart from the other films. <coughs> <coughs> Bong Joon Ho though, the only issue I have with him is that the Academy has a bias against international films. They always have. It's been a local event as long as I can remember, and no foreign film has ever won Best Picture. And as far as I can recall, no foreign director has won. That's why I feel that Bong Joon-ho is going to lose to Sam Mendes, 
and it's only because of how the Academy perceives international films. They prefer to go with American or European films, and they rarely go into Asia and, like, yeah, it's just, well, to be specific, Korea. The point is, though, Sam Mendes, like, they're just wrapping that up for him to be picked. I put my runners up as Tarantino, Scorsese, because I want to maintain my personal bias, like, in my calculation. Bong Joon-ho, that means, gets dumped to fourth, but I do not think he is the fourth best director. It's just, I, I need to see more films from him. I've seen Mother and I've seen The Host. But Parasite has really put him into, like, the next level of directing quality. And Todd Phillips is an honor to be nominated. Be, go, there for the, go there for the networking, and maybe you'll actually be able to direct a film outside of Warner Brothers' jurisdiction that allows you to have a better shot at winning one day. But man, like, this is quite a list of directors. And as a director myself, I really admire each one of these works. And I, I, I'm still hoping that Scorsese wins. Because if Scorsese wins, he'll retire. Think about that. Imagine retiring at his age with The Irishman, a three and a half hour Netflix, like, odyssey with three of the best gangster actors in history. But times have changed. Ironically, the Academy will vote for a war film director, just like how last year they went with an international director and they're not gonna do that back-to-back -back years. Though I would, be, I would love to be surprised. Again, I don't have anything against any of the directors. I'm just accounting for the bias that the Academy voters themselves seem to have. But, yep, Sam Mendes is going to win. That's just how it is. The final category. Best picture. I'm going to go in reverse order this time. So just bear with me. I'm going to start out with the ones that I feel have the least chance and then work my way up. And it seems that is seems like these are the odds that I agree with. Ford versus Ferrari. It is a sports movie. Very rare that a sports movie ever wins Best Picture. It, there's not as many racing enthusiasts as there are like baseball or football or even boxing. Rocky. <clears throat> but Ford vs. Ferrari, it's one of those films that is just, it's just happy to be nominated and it's going to win technical awards. Like, there's no chance this is going to win. Little Women is a remake of an old story. It was written by Greta Gerwig. It was adapted, but... It doesn't have the same stronghold that, like, Lady Bird had. And I will admit, I was unimpressed with Little Women. I thought that given the casting and the overall um, showcase of the costumes and, like, the ensemble fe all-female cast, aside from, you know, Timothy Chalamet, Little Women doesn't stand out in many ways. And I think a lot of people can agree with that. Marriage Story. This is the film that I feel... Yeah, thanks, Siri. Marriage Story is one of those films that started out with a lot of potential, but then flat out fell down. Like... Once other films like Jojo Rabbit, which we'll get to, and 1917 came out later in December, Marriage Story lost a lot of momentum. It, it sadly did. And I don't think it's won anything, like, aside from the Independent Spirit Awards and, like, a few other smaller festivals. But, hey, it has a great cast. And it has Noah Baumbach as the director and writer I'm surprised he got completely snubbed, like, from both those categories, because I thought it was a... I thought it was a pretty good film. Like, at one point, I was, like, so, like, held back by the performances that I really did feel like I was part of their family. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but... So now we get to the top six. I'm a little surprised that Jojo Rabbit is put above Joker and the Irishman, but... I'm going to go in the order that I I personally feel like I have the chance. So I'm going to jump up a little bit and say 
Jojo Rabbit. It may be an X Factor. It may be that wild card that wins. Last year, um, I would consider Green Book one of those um, wild cards because I was fully expecting either Roma or Black Klansman to win, even though it's a Spike Lee film and like Spike Lee has that reputation similar to Tarantino that like he does his own thing, he does the right thing. Jojo Rabbit is one of those films that, quite frankly, it could be a wild card. And I think that the performances in that film and the, you know, the, the themes of, you know, mocking Nazism and mocking Hitler, making him a very comedic side, like, fantasy character, I think that all worked very effectively. Again, I've only seen it once, and I prefer to, like, judge and properly evaluate a film after a couple of viewings. But Jojo Rabbit... It left a good taste in my mouth, and I think that it was innocent in just the right way, it was funny in just the right way, and, like, Scarlett Johansson, again, portraying as the mom, like, who doesn't want Scarlett Johansson as their mom? It's, it, she's awesome. And I think that the performances um, by the lead actor, I can't remember his name, he was adorable, he was funny, he was, like, a little obnoxious, but he enjoyed himself in that film, and you can tell. He was having a blast making that film. And I think he has a bright future. So now, moving on to the actual top five. The top five. Here it goes. Number five would probably be Joker. 11 Oscar nominations, probably gonna win maybe two or three of them. I'm definitely feeling Best Leading Actor and Best Score, though it could also possibly steal Best Adapted Screenplay away from Jojo Rabbit or... Um, yeah, probably just Jojo Rabbit. Or even The Irishman, which I, is what I voted for. But Joker, it is a t conversation starter. Given how the media portrayed Joker and they were really scared that it was going to cause a lot of problems within, like, the public and inspire, like, domestic terrorism, it did anything but that. Joker actually did the proper thing and have people start a conversation about just, you know, dealing with mental illness. Um, a lot of people struggle with mental illness every day, myself included, and... This film shows an extreme example of that and how one particular character just loses all hope over time and he just fully embraces the Joker at the end. And as a character study type of film, it's very rare that a character study actually wins Best Picture, but I know a couple of people that actually do want it to win because of the message it provides and the connection to society that the film definitely tried to make a connection to. But it doesn't have a prayer against the next four films. This is the part where I have to decide if I think Once Upon a Time or Irishman has a more realistic chance. I want to get it off my chest right now that I was hoping that Netflix would finally win Best Picture and send a message to the entire Hollywood industry and like all the studios that streaming is the future and streaming services can provide an Oscar winning experience. I don't think the Oscars going to agree with me tonight and it's disappointing, but Irishman three and a half hours long. I know a lot of people like struggle to get through it. I saw it in theaters myself back in November, right before I came onto Netflix. But Netflix gives people the accessibility to watch this film. Sure, not everyone has the time to sit through the entire three and a half hours, but if you do go through the three and a half hours, by the end, you will be feeling the same way that Frank is feeling. Like, it is just, it's unspeakable. Like, the stuff that he goes through and the, the plots that unravel over that three and a half hour span are some of Scorsese's best work as a director. Like, it's a combination of a lot of different techniques that he has applied to each one of his films over the years. But Irishman, 
I don't think it's gonna win Best Picture anymore, but I was really hoping it would. I guess Netflix has to wait like a couple years longer for it. But hey, maybe we'll be surprised. Maybe it will actually win. Next up, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I cannot stress this enough. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is one of those films that, like La La Land, it's like begging the Hollywood voters in the Oscars to vote for that film because of how much it illustrates Hollywood's golden years and how, you know, 50 years ago, like, that was how Hollywood was or, like, that's how Hollywood was similar. And a lot of the Oscar voters, a majority of them are old white men. And they would probably vote for this film because of how reminiscent they feel about that time. It's a long lost time that will never be recovered and maybe the Academy does want to finally give Tarantino the best picture honors. I would love to see it happen, but I think that the next two choices have a way better shot and I will look forward to see who actually does win. Which is now the time to talk about the two films. I can't ultimately decide between these two because both of them have great chances of winning. Maybe it is time for an international film to finally win and Parasite is the closest example of any international film that deserves it. But 1917, the Academy does love those artistic, cinematic experiences that 1917 boasts and embraces. Parasite is more of a character-driven movie, while 1917 is a visually orchestrated film. Both of them are visual and very gripping. However, I feel the plot of Parasite is way more complex and deep than 1917's is. And there's a lot of different factors, not to mention acting. It's sad that none of the actors, especially the dad in Parasite, got nominated for like Best Supporting Actor or something. But the fact that no one talks about the acting in 1917 at all definitely gives Parasite a, a slight edge. Parasite, the whole social class conflict, as well as I'm not a big fan of stories that reveal that someone is like defrauding another family especially when the fraudsters are the characters we're supposed to be rooting for i know that's the point of the film however i personally i was never a big fan of people who commit fraud like that's just a character trait that i was never able to get behind I mean, there's one thing about, like, you know, faking yourself and then ultimately, like, you do actually gain that practice. And then they eventually do come out, but they never do. Spoiler. Sorry, but... The ending to Parasite is why I want 1917 to win. Because I personally did not like how the ending worked out. I thought the ending was going to be something else. And then it ended up being as it was. And I left the film less satisfied than how I felt when I finished 1917. I've seen both films twice. And was hoping to see you know, both of them one more time. But that wasn't able to happen. That wasn't going to happen. But ultimately, I think that 1917 is going to win. Because... War films still attract popularity. It is a one long continuous take. It has all of the necessary nominations in the other categories to make it a very strong case for best picture. And most importantly, this is the big factor I feel when it comes to the Academy determining who wins. Are they ready for an international film outside of America and outside of Europe to win like, the highest honor in filmmaking. If Parasite does win, I'll be happy for them. However, I personally still want Once Upon a Time or Irishman to win. But now it's time to make it official. I'm picking 1917 as my top choice. Um, Parasite's number two. I'm going to put Once Upon a Time as three. Irishman, four. Joker, f five. 
Jojo Rabbit 6, and then all the aforementioned films in their respective orders. That's it. I'm done. <sighs> Stay tuned, folks, because there's going to be quite a night tonight at the Oscars. Take care.